I'm an engineer, a researcher. Um, I work for a research institute in Italy. And um, as any engineer in this world, I like to build machines. And uh, my machines are a bit peculiar. They look like us. Um, at least this is my desire, my long-term desire of making machines that look like human. Now, um, this is my definition of myself, but if you go and ask my collaborators, you'll hear something different. I'm the guy who wants to be the salesman, the one that wants to put a robot in every home. And I think that also partially true. Um, I think robotics has the potential to change our lives for good, and one of these changes has to happen through consumers. It cannot happen through a single robot being built, uh, no matter how beautiful and special it could be. Um, it happens only if it gets to our places, if we, the cost goes down because we build millions of them. And that's going to be our helpers, our companions, uh, interacting with us and uh, you know, changing our lives seriously. Um, I'd like to tell you also another story. It's slightly different, but it's also a story of engineering. Uh, you may recognize this picture. If you Google for it, it's the first flight. Well, not really the first flight, but the first flight of a machine that was heavier than air. So something that naturally wouldn't float in the air, uh, so it had to be engineered somehow. This is um, a result of um, a work by two guys that were building bicycles, and at a certain point had the dream, the dream of making a machine to fly. I thought it was powerful. I really like flying, by the way, but this one, I think the story is beautiful from, also from the engineering point of view. And, um, you know, they started in 1903, they made the first flight, um, 100 meters, maybe, you know, ridiculously short. Uh, but a couple of years later, just to prove that technology was right, they made kilometers. And then, you know, 10 years later, they were flying across the states doing demonstrations. People were amazed by these flying machines, and they were working. I mean, the engineering was right. They got all the pieces in the correct places, so the machine was correct. I mean, 60-something years later, we went to the moon, and the technology well, it changed a bit, of course, but it was the same, same principles. Aerodynamics, uh, wings, uh, you know, engines, powerful engines, more powerful to go to the moon, but still, that was the technology that they started. So imagine, these two people started a huge industry that changed our lives. Nowadays, one billion people traveling every year, and that's by flight. Um, why did they got it right? And... Uh, this is part of the reason. Number one, they went looking to nature. And this is something we do quite often when we look at technology, not only when you do biology, but also when you do engineering. Uh, you go and look at what nature was doing. So they went looking for uh, birds, and they look at the wings, they started analyzing them, so that was a source of inspiration for sure. The other thing they got right was to make experiments. They had other colleagues, uh, pretty much the same years, that died trying to fly, um, but they were more careful. Um, their father was a bit more worried about them flying, so he said, never fly together. I cannot stand losing the two of you together. <laughs> so they, what they did was to try stuff, to write down equations, but also to try them. So they built, in 1903, a wind tunnel. You understand me, it was 1903, building a wind tunnel was very revolutionary. And the other thing they got it right was to understand that the system was complicated. So they couldn't do it with um, just by analyzing a single piece together. This is a gets a bit technical, but bear with me for a moment. So, for instance, one thing they couldn't do was flying straight and turn. At a certain point, they understood that for flying straight and turn, the equations had to be modified, so stability was guaranteed by rolling. If you don't roll, you're not stable. So these things say that if you are to analyze a complex system, sometimes you have to look at the entirety of the system. You cannot cut in pieces too much, because certain interactions are important. So that's Again, another piece of the lesson. Now, why is this relevant to what I do? 
Well, I think it's a nice story, by the way, but it's also relevant. Um, we also like to copy something from nature, because if we have to build machines that will be populating our homes, at certain point these machines have to interact with us, have to have an intelligence that is comparable to us. And so what we like to copy is this stuff. Well, what is this? This is a brain. It's a brain image obtained from a particular mathematical technique that takes magnetic resonance images and traces the connections. Uh, this is a very powerful thing that allows us now to understand certain um, part of the brain connectivity on a large scale. Um, is this important? Well, European Commission put a billion euros on this, uh, not specifically in this image, by the way, but um, on understanding the brain, on looking at all the connections one by one, metaphorically speaking, and building simulations of this connectivity in computers. So building the best possible model of a living brain. So this is just to tell you the scale of the effort. Now, this is what we like to do, build machines that have a brain. Now, um, why the Wright brothers were important? Because we copy nature, we copy the brain, we have to do experiments. For these reasons, the robots that I build are important because this is the way to do the experiments. You connect a brain to a body, you go there, and you see whether it works. The other thing is that the brain is fairly too complex to be understood just by looking at the single neurons. You have to build these big systems somehow. Um, and so this is what I, I try to do. And uh, unfortunately, it wasn't entirely new. I mean, I'm not the only one preaching for doing this. Uh, it started in the 1600s, maybe, by Descartes. Um, he was doing this work where he thought the brain was done by well, it was working through pumping fluids. That was the technology at the time. You know, fluids, uh, pipes, uh, pumps were things that were understood. And so he thought the brain was something that was somehow moving fluids, moving the muscles, and eventually that's the way you move. But it was, you know, possible model, why not? Um, and then if you look at the second image next to it, you see something slightly different, that's the time of the telegraph, so when electricity came about, and that's also a brain model, actually that's part of the spinal cord, model does a set of switches. That was again the technology at the time. Um, then things changed a bit. Um, in, uh, after a few years, people started looking at equations and modeling these equations in uh, analog computers. This is the other image that is shown there as a sort of block diagram with arrows connecting things. That's, again, a model of part of the brain obtained through a specific uh, implementation in a, an analog computer. And then came the digital revolution, the neural networks. The other image you see there is a um, little machine made of many, many interconnections. That's the way we simulate uh, neural networks, uh, biological neural networks into computers. And uh, the last one is a robot, it's my robot, in fact, and it's what I do. I think at the end, we understood that we need a body if we have to build a brain that does something useful. So it cannot be done without a body. And uh, do you want this one? No. This is a body. That, I mean, it's a human robot in a sense. Look at it, it's scary. Um, it's a robot that has been built for a particular task. This is a result of, um, in a sense, result, but uh, it's been built for the DARPA robotics competition. It's a competition in the US to build a robot that goes there and saves lives by intervening in disaster situation. This is very useful. I don't want to criticize anybody, but it, this is not the stuff I would like to see in my place and my home. Um, well, it's a bit scary. This is the most dangerous robot ever built. I mean, it's actuated by hydraulic uh, um, actuators, so it's very powerful, very energy, the energy density is huge, and it's also, um, um, it, it's also heavy. I mean, this is uh, 250 pounds, so, you know, yeah, if it falls, it makes a hole in the ground. So, this is not the technology really I like to see at home. I like to see something different. And so, oh, where do we start from? Well, what do we need to model for on the brain uh, to, to build a different technology? Um, 
we started thinking, and luckily, I managed to meet once um, a bunch of guys, um, well, very renowned scientists, um, that also in Italy, um, that was a lucky place to be, um, understood something fundamental of the way the brain interacts with, um, with, you know, with the external environment, but also how our brains allow us to interact with each other. And in particular, they discovered something called mirror neurons. Now, this, the discovery was really exceptional for one reason. They were looking in a motor area of the brain, so a part that normally will control my grasping movements, and they found um, neurons that were responsive to vision. That was kind of strange. I mean, this is 25 years ago, maybe, or 20 years ago. And it was strange because, um, you know, the vision we had of the brain at that time was, OK, here I have my visual cortex, here I have my motor cortex, they are somehow connected together. Vision, I see something, then I move, and I grasp something. Well, the truth was slightly different because they found the visual response in neurons here. That's a motor cortex, shouldn't be happening. Um, the fact is the brain was a, a lot more full of surprises than what we think or what we thought. Um, so they found these neurons that respond to the site of a particular action being performed, but the same neuron is also responsible for you generating the same action. So there's a matching, a response, a resonance between what you see and actually what you do. And that's important because it says that for understanding something, you also have to be able to do the same thing. So for understanding grasping, uh, when I see you doing an action, well, maybe I'm simulating myself what you're doing and sort of empathizing with you. I'm with you and observing what you do, but as if I were doing the same thing. So that, that's a nice and important message. The other thing is that they discover the same is true for speech. So at this very moment, um, you understanding me because you're sort of simulating what I'm saying in your brain, in your motor cortex. That's really strange. Why the hell are you sitting there doing nothing? You're activating your motor cortex when I'm speaking? That's, I think it's, there's a lesson to be learned here, especially for us roboticists, because if we expect to be building machines that can understand us, then these machines have to have a, a system similar to this one. And uh, I mean, this is a bit more technical again, sorry about that, but it just shows that if you stimulate the brain in a particular place, you lower the reaction time for you to understand a particular phoneme. The phonemes can be dental, so-called dental phonemes, like uh, T, where you have to move the tongue towards the teeth, or labial, like P. And uh, I mean, what happens is that if I stimulate the place where you pronounce the T, then, and you're listening to a T in that particular instant of time, your reaction time goes down. You recognize the phoneme faster. And that's very specific. These two crosses, like these two graphs like this, says that it's specific to each phoneme. They're separate and they work uh, exactly the same way, just different part of the brain that is controlling the lips and the tongue. So this is the proof that this is true in humans. I mean, all the other results were from monkeys, from animal studies, so they couldn't be really attached to human speech, but this one is for speech. And so what we said, well, we need to build this stuff into robots. We need to have robots that actually interact with people. This is my robot. This is what I designed. Um, well, not alone. Um, we are a group of about 50 people, actually, because there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and this is the, the robot I like to place in your homes. Well, maybe not, you know, it's not going to be this one. So maybe it's slightly different. Let's see uh, what, what we manage to do in the future. And uh, how to do this robot? Um, OK, I say this is a nice robot, but does it move nicely? What it takes to make it move like a person? OK, let's see what it takes. Um, we did a bit of experiments. We've taken this robot, and we um, asked people to basically look at actions performed by this robot as this is a nice property. I'm not going to tell you about specifically this experiment, because it's it will take too long entering into the details, but I'd like to tell you these things. You see this graph? This is a comparison between what, when a person is doing something when the robot is doing something. It's a graph of a performance of an observer, a person, that is looking either at the person or at the robot. And you see what happens? 
all the dots are in a 45 degree line. So there's no difference between the robot and the person. So we managed to do a movement of the robot. It was a movement like this, take something from A, place in B, um, repeat the action, and you're watching. If you're watching me, uh, you're like there in the graph. If you're watching a robot, you're like there. But if you compare the two, no difference. So it seems like we managed to do something that looks like a person. Unconsciously, because these experiments measure your gaze, where you're looking, rather than your, um, any other m measurement where you have to judge and say, does it look like a human? Maybe if you ask, does it look like a human? No, it doesn't. But in unconsciously, it, it does. Um, and this is true also if you're asked to watch the robot, like in this case, and imitate what the robot is doing, another graph. And again, straight line. So no matter what is the action shown by the robot and what is in a given speed, uh, you imitate this, the, the, the action by using the same speed the robot was using. Of course, I mean, there's a slight difference. A person is much faster than a robot. That's a technological limitation, but it doesn't matter because the two things correlate. So the robot is just slower. So this is not a 45 degree line as, uh, as shown earlier, but who cares? I mean, the important point is that you see the robot moving, you unconsciously imitate the robot. So I think that, that was very powerful. And now I'd like to show the robot for real. And this is a short video that shows what the robot does. Um, this is how it looks like. Um, you know, is waking up in the morning and can move the hands. Now you see that uh, it can actually watch its own hands. And uh, uh, you see there are fingers. So it can grasp objects. Um, this is the point of view of the robot, for instance. And now, looks at objects, it recognizes them. And uh, if you put an object there on the table and you say, where is the red ball? The robot understands you, that you're looking for the red ball, it knows what a red ball is, and points at the object. So, I hope you get an idea. Um, was this successful in general? Well, let's see. I um, have a couple more results to show. Uh, this is with kids. We brought the robot, as you see, moving, doing demos, and uh, this was an exhibition fair, and look at the faces. I mean, I think, uh, you know, <laughs> you, you can judge yourself. Um, does it work with, I don't know, journalists? Yes, I mean. Um, I got contacted by this Japanese journalist. We got into the cover page of this uh, journal. With politicians, ooh, it works, it works. It made them <laughs> smile, so I think it's, uh, it's working well. Now to close my presentation, this was where we started, what I like to copy, the beautiful engineering of the Wright brothers. This is where we are now. It took 100 years, not a short time, by the way, but uh, you know. Nonetheless, this is uh, the most advanced artificial intelligence, so to speak, and this is what we, we may want to get in the future, um, but I hope to take, you know, this takes less than 100 years. I'd like really to see it, to see a robot in every home.